shaded all his shield, stood over against him, but the ghostly semblance passed him by and slew the man at his side. Such as I understand was the tale which Epizelus told. Datis, meanwhile, was on his way back to Asia, and had reached Myconus when he saw in his sleep a vision. What it was isn't known, but no sooner was day come than he caused strict search to be made throughout the whole fleet, and finding on board a Phoenician vessel an image of Apollo overlaid with gold, he inquired from whence it had been taken, and learning to what temple it belonged, he took it with him in his own ship to Delos, and placed it in the temple there, enjoining the Delians, who had now come back to their island, to restore the image to the Theban Delium, which lies on the coast over against Chalcis. Having left these injunctions, he sailed away, but the Delians failed to restore the statue, and it wasn't till twenty years afterwards that the Thebans, warned by an oracle, themselves brought it back to Delium. As for the Eritreans, whom Datis and Artaphernes had carried away captive, when the fleet reached Asia, they were taken up to Susa. Now King Darius, before they were made his prisoners, nourished a fierce anger against these men for having injured him without provocation. But now that he saw them brought into his presence and become his subjects, he did them no other harm but only settled them at one of his own stations in Kissia, a place called Arderica, two hundred and ten furlongs distant from Susa, and forty from the well which yields produce of three different kinds. For from this well they get a bitumen, salt, and oil, procuring it in the way that I'll now describe. They draw with a swipe, and instead of a bucket make use of the half of a wineskin. With this the man dips, and after drawing, pours the liquid into a reservoir, wherefrom it passes into another, and there takes three different shapes. The salt and the bitumen forthwith collect and harden, while the oil is drawn off into casks. It's called by the Persians radinasi, is black and has an unpleasant smell. Here then King Darius established the Eritreans, and here they continued to my time, and still spoke their old language. So thus it fared with the Eritreans. After the full of the moon, two thousand Lacedaemonians came to Athens. So eager had they been to arrive in time, that they took but three days to reach Attica from Sparta. They came, however, too late for the battle. Yet as they had a longing to behold the Medes, they continued their march to Marathon, and there viewed the slain. Then, after giving the Athenians all praise for their achievement, they departed and returned home. But it fills me with wonderment, and I can in no wise believe the report, that the Alcmyonidae had an understanding with the Persians and held them up a shield as a signal, wishing Athens to be brought under the yoke of the barbarians and of Hippias. The Alcmyonidae, who have shown themselves at least as bitter haters of tyrants as was Callias, the son of Phinepus, and father of Hipponicus. This Callias was the only person at Athens who, when the Pisistratidae were driven out, and their goods were exposed for sale by the vote of the people, had the courage to make purchases, and likewise in many other ways to display the strongest hostility. He was a man very worthy to be had in remembrance by all on several accounts, for not only did he thus distinguish himself beyond others in the cause of his country's freedom, but likewise by the honours which he gained at the Olympic Games, where he carried off the prize in the horse race, and was second in the four-horse chariot race, and by his victory at an earlier period in the Pythian Games, he showed himself in the eyes of all the Greeks a man most unsparing in his expenditure, he was remarkable too for his conduct in respect of his daughters, three in number, for when they came to be of marriageable age, he gave to each of them a most ample dowry, and placed it at their own disposal, allowing them to choose their husbands from among all the citizens of Athens, and giving each in marriage to the man of her own choice. Now the Alcmyonidae fell not a whit short of this person in their hatred of tyrants, so that I am astonished at the charge made against them, and can't bring myself to believe that they held up a shield. 
for they were men who had remained in exile during the whole time that the tyranny lasted, and they even contrived the trick by which the Pisistratidae were deprived of their throne. Indeed, I look upon them as the persons who, in good truth, gave Athens her freedom far more than Harmodius and Aristogiton, for these last did but exasperate the other Pisistratidae by slaying Hipparchus, and were far from doing anything towards putting down the tyranny, whereas the Alcmaeonidae were manifestly the actual deliverers of Athens, if at least it be true that the Pythoness was prevailed upon by them to bid the Lacedaemonians set Athens free, as I've already related. But perhaps they were offended with the people of Athens, and therefore betrayed their country. Nay, but on the contrary, there were none of the Athenians who were held in such general esteem, or who were so laden with honours, so that it isn't even reasonable to suppose that a shield was held up by them on this account. A shield was shown, no doubt. That cannot be gainsaid, but who it was that showed it, I can't any further determine. Now the Alcmaonidae were, in days of yore, a family of note at Athens, but from the time of Alcmaon and again of Megacles, they rose to special eminence. The former of these two personages, to wit Alcmaion, the son of Megacles, when Croesus the Lydian sent men from Sardis to consult the Delphic oracle, gave aid gladly to his messengers and assisted them to accomplish their task. Croesus, informed of Alcmaion's kindnesses by the Lydians, who from time to time conveyed his messages to the god, sent for him to Sardis, and when he arrived made him a present of as much gold as he should be able to carry at one time about his person. Finding that this was the gift assigned him, Alcmaion took his measures and prepared himself to receive it in the following way. He clothed himself in a loose tunic which he made to bag greatly at the waist, and placing upon his feet the widest buskins that he could anywhere find, followed his guides into the treasure house. Here he fell too upon a heap of gold dust, and in the first place packed as much as he could inside his buskins, between them and his legs, after which he filled the breast of his tunic quite full of gold, and then sprinkling some among his hair and taking some likewise in his mouth, he came forth from the treasure house scarcely able to drag his legs along, like anything rather than a man, with his mouth crammed full and his bulk increased every way. On seeing him, Croesus burst into a laugh, and not only let him have all that he had taken, but gave him presents besides of fully equal worth. Thus this house became one of great wealth, and Alcmaion was able to keep horses for the chariot race and won the prize at Olympia. Afterwards, in the generation which followed, Cleisthenes, king of Sicyon, raised the family to still greater eminence among the Greeks than even that to which it had attained before. For this Cleisthenes, who was the son of Aristonymus, the grandson of Myron, and the great-grandson of Andreas, had a daughter called Agarista, whom he wished to marry to the best husband that he could find in the whole of Greece. At the Olympic Games, therefore, having gained the prize in the chariot race, he caused a public proclamation to be made to the following effect. Whoever among the Greeks deems himself worthy to become the son-in-law of Cleisthenes, let him come sixty days hence, or, if he will, sooner to Sicyon. For within a year's time, counting from the end of the sixty days, Cleisthenes will decide on the man to whom he shall contract his daughter. So all the Greeks who were proud of their own merit or of their country flocked to Sicyon as suitors, and Cleisthenes had a foot course and a wrestling ground made ready to try their powers. From Italy there came Smindirides, the son of Hippocrates, a native of Sybaris, which city about that time was at the very height of its prosperity. He was a man who in luxuriousness of living exceeded all other persons. Likewise there came Demasus, the son of Amiris, surnamed to the Wise, a native of Syris, these two were the only suitors from Italy. 
From the Ionian Gulf appeared Amphimnestus, the son of Epistrophus, an Epidemnian. From Aetolia, Marlies, the brother of that Titormus who excelled all the Greeks in strength, and who, wishing to avoid his fellow men, withdrew himself into the remotest parts of the Aetolian territory. From the Peloponnese came several, Leocides, son of that Phidon, king of the Argives, who established weights and measures throughout the Peloponnese, and was the most insolent of all the Grecians, the same who drove out the Elean directors of the games, and himself presided over the contests at Olympia. Leocides, I say, appeared, this Phidon's son, and likewise Amiantus, son of Lycurgus, an Arcadian of the city of Trebesus, Laphanes, an Azenian of Pius, whose father Euphorion, as the story goes in Arcadia, entertained the Dioscuri at his residence, and thenceforth kept open house for all comers. And lastly, Onomastus, the son of Agaius, a native of Elis. These four came from the Peloponnese. From Athens there arrived Megacles, the son of that Alcmaion who visited Croesus, and Tisander's son, Hippoclides, the wealthiest and handsomest of the Athenians. There was likewise one Eubian, Lysanias, who came from Eritrea, then a flourishing city. From Thessaly came Diotorides, a Cranonian of the race of the Scopadi, and Alcon arrived from the Molossians. This was the list of the suitors. Now when all were come and the day appointed had arrived, Cleisthenes first of all inquired of each concerning his country and his family, after which he kept them with him a year and made trial of their manly bearing, their temper, their accomplishments and their disposition, sometimes drawing them apart for converse, sometimes bringing them all together. Such as were still youths he took with him from time to time to the gymnasia, but the greatest trial of all was at the banquet table. During the whole period of their stay he lived with them, as I've said, and further, from first to last, he entertained them sumptuously. Somehow or other the suitors who came from Athens pleased him the best of all, and of these Hippoclides, Tisander's son, was especially in favour, partly on account of his manly bearing, and partly also because his ancestors were of kin to the Corinthian Kypsilids. When at length the day arrived which had been fixed for the espousals, and Cleisthenes had to speak out and declare his choice, he first of all made a sacrifice of a hundred oxen, and held a banquet, whereat he entertained all the suitors and the whole people of Sicyon. After the feast was ended, the suitors vied with each other in music and in speaking on a given subject. Presently, as the drinking advanced, Hippoclides, who quite dumbfounded the rest, called aloud to the flute player, and bade him strike up a dance, which the man did, and Hippoclides danced to it, and he fancied that he was dancing excellently well, but Cleisthenes, who was observing him, began to misdoubt the whole business. Then Hippoclides, after a pause, told an attendant to bring in a table, and when it was brought, he mounted upon it and danced first of all some Laconian figures, then some Attic ones, after which he stood on his head upon the table and began to toss his legs about. Cleisthenes, notwithstanding that he now loathed Hippoclides for a son-in-law by reason of his dancing and his shamelessness, still as he wished to avoid an outbreak, had restrained himself during the first and likewise during the second dance. When, however, he saw him tossing his legs in the air, he could no longer contain himself, but cried out, Son of Tisander, thou hast danced thy wife away. What does Hippocrates care, was the other's answer, and hence the proverb arose. Then Cleisthenes commanded silence, and spake thus before the assembled company. Suitors of my daughter, well pleased am I with you all, and right willingly, if it were possible, would I content you all, and not by making choice of one appear to put a slight upon the rest, but as it's out of my power, seeing that I have but one daughter to grant to all their wishes, I'll present to each of you whom I must needs dismiss a talent of silver for the honour that you have done me in seeking to ally yourself with my house and for your long absence from your homes. But my daughter Agarista I betroth to Megacles, the son of Alcmaion, to be his wife according to the usage and wont of Athens. 
Then Megacles expressed his readiness and Cleisthenes had the marriage solemnized. Thus ended the affair of the suitors, and thus the Alcmaeonidae came to be famous throughout the whole of Greece. The issue of this marriage was the Cleisthenes, so named after his grandfather, the Sicyonian, who made the tribes at Athens and set up the popular government. Megacles had likewise another son called Hippocrates, whose children were a Megacles and an Agarista, the latter named after Agarista, the daughter of Cleisthenes. She married Xanthippus, the son of Ariphron, and when she was with child by him had a dream, wherein she fancied that she was delivered of a lion, after which within a few days she bore Xanthippus a son, to wit Pericles. After the blow struck at Marathon, Miltiades, who was previously held in high esteem by his countrymen, increased yet more in influence. Hence, when he told them that he wanted a fleet of seventy ships with an armed force and money, without informing them what country he was going to attack, but only promising to enrich them if they would accompany him, seeing that it was a right wealthy land where they might easily get as much gold as they cared to have, when he told them this, they were quite carried away and gave him the whole armament which he required. So Miltiades, having got the armament, sailed against Paros with the object, as he alleged, of punishing the Parians for having gone to war with Athens, inasmuch as a trireme of theirs had come with the Persian fleet to Marathon. This, however, was a mere pretense. The truth was that Miltiades owed the Parians a grudge, because Lysagoras, the son of Tisias, who was a Parian by birth, had told tales against him to Hidarnes the Persian. Arrived before the place against which his expedition was designed, he drove the Parians within their walls and forthwith laid siege to the city. At the same time he sent a herald to the inhabitants and required of them a hundred talents, threatening that if they refused he would press the siege and never give it over till the town was taken. But the Parians, without giving his demand a thought, proceeded to use every means that they could devise for the defence of their city, and even invented new plans for the purpose, one of which was, by working at night to raise such parts of the wall as were likely to be carried by assault, to double their former height. Thus far all the Greeks agree in their accounts of this business. What follows is related upon the testimony of the Parians only. Miltiades had come to his wit's end when one of the prisoners, a woman named Timo, who was by birth a Parian, and had held the office of under-priestess in the temple of the infernal goddesses, came and conferred with him. This woman, they say, being introduced into the presence of Miltiades, advised him, if he set great store by the capture of the place, to do something which she could suggest to him. When therefore she had told him what it was she meant, he betook himself to the hill which lies in front of the city, and there leapt the fence enclosing the precinct of Demeter Thesmophorus, since he was not able to open the door. After leaping into the place, he went straight to the sanctuary, intending to do something within it, either to remove some of the holy things which it wasn't lawful to stir, or to perform some act or other, I can't say what, and had just reached the door, when suddenly a feeling of horror came upon him, and he returned back the way he had come. But in jumping down from the outer wall, he strained his thigh, or, as some say, struck the ground with his knee. So Miltiades returned home sick, without bringing the Athenians any money, and without conquering Paros, having done no more than to besiege the town for six and twenty days, and ravage the remainder of the island. The Parians, however, when it came to their knowledge that Timo, the under-priestess of the goddesses, had advised Miltiades what he should do, were minded to punish her for her crime. They therefore sent messengers to Delphi as soon as the siege was at an end, and asked the god if they should put the under-priestess to death. She had discovered, they said, to the enemies of her country how they might bring it into subjection, and had exhibited to Miltiades mysteries which it wasn't lawful for a man to know. 
But the Pythoness forbade them and said Timo was not in fault. T'was decreed that Miltiades should come to an unhappy end, and she was sent to lure him to his destruction. Such was the answer given to the Parians by the Pythoness. The Athenians, upon the return of Miltiades from Paris, had much debate concerning him, and Xanthippus, the son of Ariphron, who spoke more freely against him than all the rest, impleaded him before the people, and brought him to trial for his life, on the charge of having dealt deceitfully with the Athenians. Miltiades, though he was present in court, didn't speak in his own defence, for his thigh had begun to mortify and disabled him from pleading his cause. He was forced to lie on a couch while his defence was made by his friends, who dwelt at most length on the fight at Marathon, while they made mention also of the capture of Lemnos, telling how Miltiades took the island, and after executing vengeance on the Pelasgians, gave up his conquest to Athens. The judgment of the people was in favour so far as to spare his life, but for the wrong he had done them they fined him fifty talents. Soon afterwards his thigh completely gangrened and mortified, and so Miltiades died, and the fifty talents were paid by his son, Cimon. Now the way in which Miltiades had made himself master of Lemnos was the following. There were certain Pelasgians whom the Athenians once drove out of Attica. Whether they did it justly or unjustly, I can't say, since I only know what is reported concerning it, which is the following. Hecate